So uh, we are in the last chunk of Judges this morning. Um, Judges 19, through 19, 20, and 21 is what we're going to be going through today. And between, again, just me still feeling tender from worship and just in this spot with the Lord as I'm talking to you and then having to cover three chapters in one service that are, it's just filled with easy and light topics, right? With all of that, we're going to see where we can go today. Um, but if you want to open your Bibles to Judges chapter 19, we're going to be skipping through, or I should say jumping from passage to passage within uh, this chunk of three chapters, because uh, there's a lot going on. It's mostly narrative, but um, just to set the stage and acknowledge what we're going to talk about, what we're talking about today, and the story that's told is not an easy one. Um, If you've read or heard of Sodom and Gomorrah, most of us probably have, um, this is in some ways a rehashing of that story and all of the um, just tragic, gross sinfulness of that story. A lot of that is happening here. Um, and it's, it's a hard passage. It's not one that I, if I'm honest, I don't think I've ever heard anybody preach Judges 19, 20, and 21 for as long as I've been in the church. But there's a, a few things that I want to address going into it so we sort of have uh, the right framework to address the story as we go in. Does that sound good? Um, as I've been thinking through this and praying through this and as I've just studied the Bible in general, um, here's what I've learned. A holy book or a God that does not speak to the realities of human life has no authority to speak to the realities of human life. We would all very much like to pretend that the Bible is a G-rated, easy to understand book, but the reality is that it's not. And I am actually encouraged by the fact that it's not because that's not the world that we live in. The world that we live in is filled with the kind of brokenness that we see in this story. And we serve a God who sees that and actually doesn't shy away from it. I'll say this as a side note too. One of the reasons that the church does not have the authority that we've had in previous seasons is because there are issues that we refuse to speak to until they come knocking on our door. If we can exercise the muscle in here of not shying away from things that make us uncomfortable and actually learning to lean into what does the Bible say? What does God say about a thing? Then when the enemy comes knocking, we're ready. So I'm, you know, as maybe not intimidated as like, as I'm approaching this passage and it's certainly not the easiest one I've ever preached. I'm also excited to go into it because I wit. I will that we would not be the type of people and the type of church that would shy away from things that make us uncomfortable. I'm trying to. (laughs) And then just to set, again, a little bit more context. Um, You guys realize that that the Bible is a book, yes? That sounds like a stupid question, but here's why why I ask that. Uh, Books have literary genres And literary genres have purposes that they were written. Yeah? So even even though Judges is a history, the way that uh, ancient Near Eastern cultures, that's just a fancy scholarly way of talking about uh, cultures from around the same time as Israel was around and stuff in the Bible, uh, the way that they approached history was not so much in the way that we do of like, let me give you the second by second replay of every detail that happened. They wrote it for a specific purpose. And if you've, again, followed with us through the series of Judges, you've seen the cyclical pattern, right? They get in trouble, they cry out, Lord raises up a deliverer, they do okay for a little bit, deliverer dies, they sin, and then we go back into this pattern. So the author of Judges is trying to get a point across. So as we've gone through all these patterns, last week, uh, Pastor Bob got into it a little bit, uh, but as we've sort of gone from these overarching patterns, now the narrative is zooming into not just the high profile judges of the day. He's zooming into, it's not just these people that are having issues. It's the normal everyday person who's abandoned God in the way that we're talking about. So he's zooming in, he's trying to make a point. And you can even see this if you, again, read the very beginning of Judges 19 and the very end of Judges 21 
we see this phrase that we've read a few different times. There was no king in Israel in those days, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And the, again, just to give you a little bit of nerd stuff, because I like talking about it. Whenever you have that kind of a, a sentiment or a statement at the very beginning of a passage and at the very end, it's called an inclusio for those of you who care to know the technical term. But basically what it's doing is sort of a parenthetical. It's saying, this is what we're talking about. Everything in the middle of this speaks to the content of that phrase. So all these three chapters are speaking to this is what happens when there's no king in Israel and when everyone does what's right in their own eyes. We get the sort of stuff that we're about to read about. So with all of that, lots of interjection, <laughs> I'm going to start reading uh, in chapter 19, verse 1. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a Levite staying in a remote part of the hill country of Ephraim acquired a woman from Bethlehem in Judah as his concubine. But she was unfaithful to him and left him for her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. She was there for three or four months. Then her husband got up and followed her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had a servant with him and a pair of donkeys. So he brought him to her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, detained him. And he stayed with him for three days. They ate, drank, and spent the nights there. So with all of these passages, again, if you've been reading through them with us, they're pretty long. There's a lot of detail, a lot of going on. Again, this is the author of Judges trying to draw our attention to certain things. And even as he's drawing our attention to certain things, it's so that we would get the sort of flipped upside down, you know, sort of evilly ironic nature of what's happening. So as he's drawing our attention in chapter 19 to the hospitality of the father, this is to a certain degree expected in this culture. In Middle Eastern cultures, particularly back around this time frame, hospitality was like the highest social virtue. If you had an even in Deuteronomy and Exodus, God gives very specific instructions for how Israel is to treat foreigners, how they're to treat people who happen to be in their towns as they're passing through. So there, an Israelite reader or listener, as it were, would be hearing the story and hearing what the father-in-law is doing and going like, oh, this makes sense. He's got family visiting. He's going to bring out the good stuff. He's going to party. He's going to entertain. And he's going to fulfill his social duty, his social obligation to be the entertainer and provide hospitality. So as we go through the rest of chapter 19, this chunk of it, we see that the father-in-law keeps detaining him. They get up, they're ready to go. It's like, ah, oh, why don't you just, it's almost nighttime. Let me make you dinner. Just stay for a few, just stay for one more night. Happens again, happens again. And again, this is all to draw our attention to the fact that there's this really hospitable person in this story. Eventually, the Levite gets to the point where he's like, no, I need to go home. How many of the introverts in the room said amen? <laughs> he says, no, I'm done. I need to go home. So he, his servant, and his concubine, they get up and they start traveling. And as they're traveling, um, it's the end of the day already. So as you could imagine, traveling on donkey and by foot in the middle of the night is probably not a safe thing to do. So as the day starts to come to a close, they notice, the servant notices, hey, uh, there's this town, Jebus, uh, right over here. Can we just stay here for the night instead of trying to press forward? And as a side note, the author names this town and gives us the details of what this town is specifically to draw our attention again to the fact that Israel did not do what they were supposed to do. It notes that this was a Canaanite town. It notes that this was a town that had Israel, when they entered into the land, done what God told them to do by driving the Canaanites out, this, this story would not be the case. So the author's drawing our attention to the fact, okay, this is here, the city is here, filled with Canaanite people because Israel didn't do what they were supposed to do. The Levite looks at that and he says, no, I don't feel comfortable staying in a town that's not filled with my countrymen not filled with Israelites, which given their history makes some sense. So they push through and then they get to Gibeah. And then we, as we move on through the story, kind of jumping down to verse 10, 
it says this, but the man was unwilling to spend the night. He got up, departed, and arrived opposite Jebus. The man had uh, his two saddled donkeys and his concubine with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was gone. I'm sort of rehashing this. The servant said to his master, please, why not let us stop at this Jebusite city and spend the night there? But his master replied to him, we will not stop at a foreign city where there are no Israelites. Let's move on to Gibeah. Come on, he said, let's try to reach one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. So they continued on their journey and the sun set as they neared Gibeah and Benjamin. They stopped to go in and spend the night in Gibeah. The Levite went in and sat down in the city square, but no one took them into their home to spend the night. And so now we come to the reason why the author was spending so much time focusing on the hospitality of the father-in-law. Because again, we're not just talking about the generosity of one man. We're talking about something that was a social norm. It was expected of you that if you saw somebody who was, you know, your brethren in a sense, who was a part of Israel and you saw them in the city square, it was very much expected of you. Somebody's going to take them in, give them a place to stay, feed them, do all of that. They get to this Israelite city where the Levite believes he would be safe and nobody Nobody brings them into his home. So we're starting to see the degradation of Israel as a society. We're starting to see the unraveling. And again, if you've read with us, you know that it gets a lot worse from here. But we're starting to see this unraveling. And as we move forward, the story tells us that this old man from Ephraim, who's in a similar place that the Levite is from, comes out and he notices them in the city square. And he's like, hey, is nobody... Nobody given you a place to stay. Nobody's invited you in. And the Levite says, no, nobody's invited us in. And just to sort of put a little extra salt on the wound of the fact that like nobody's invited them in, he even goes so far as to say, and I, look, we literally just need a place to stay. That's why he goes in to talk about, I've got wine and bread for me and my family. I've got hay for my donkeys. Like he's even saying, just, I just need a place to stay. I'm not even going to impose on you to like give out of your resources. So we're really seeing again, sort of the depth of how far Israel has gone when it comes to the hospitality that they were commanded to give. And now we come to the uncomfortable part. <laughs> As we move forward in this Levite uh, stays in this man's home, now, all of a sudden, the people that this Levite thought he would be safe around, it says that a group of men came and surrounded the house, knocked on the door, and told the man from the city, give us the man who's staying with you so that we can sleep with him. Again, this is meant to draw your attention back to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And also, this is meant to, the, the kind of, angst and disgust that you're feeling right now, that's intentional. The author put this together so that you would feel the dissonance of like, we've heard something like this before. This should, like, this is wrong in and of itself, but what are the people of God doing in a place where they're doing this to people? To make matters even worse, the pattern continues again, sort of following along the same lines of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The host says, leave the people I'm protecting alone, take my daughter. Then the Levite says, you know, as there's continuing to be belligerent, he just basically shoves his concubine out the door and says, do what you need to do. Just leave us alone. Scripture tells us that this woman was abused and then come morning time, she collapses on the door. And then the Levite tries to shake her like, hey, get up, we need to go. Finds that she's dead. And then he proceeds to cut up her body and send these different parts to different cities and territories in Israel as an indictment against them to say, this is what the people of this town did. Think about it. I need a response. So this is sort of the part one of this whole story where we see this is just the point that Israel's gotten to. We like to, we like to sort of sterilize our own disobedience sometimes. And I'll, I'll hit on this again as we go through the rest of the story, but 
I think so much of why this chunk of scripture is in here is because, again, we do sterilize our own disobedience. So many times we reduce obedience to what God asks us to do. We reduce it to just, these are my orders and I'm either going to follow my marching orders or not. Forgetting that we actually serve a good and loving God who sees what's on the other side of our obedience or our disobedience. I made a statement at the beginning of today. You become like what you worship. If you'll remember part of one of the reasons why God told Israel that they needed to kick the Canaanites out of the land wasn't necessarily because he had anything against the Canaanites specifically. It's because he said, if you intermarry with them, they will draw your hearts away after other gods. So now we're seeing a situation where Israel has not done what they were told to do. What God said would happen did happen. Their hearts were drawn away after other gods. And now they're becoming like the things that they worship. And now there's no distinction between the people of God and the pagan societies that they were sent in to kick out. No difference. And then it progresses. If we move on to chapter 20, starting in verse 1, all the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came out and the community assembled as one body before the Lord at Mizpah. The leaders of all the peoples and all of the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of God's people, 400,000 armed foot soldiers. The Benjaminites heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. And then it goes on to tell us that they didn't join them. So I'm wanting to zero in on the language of this particular verse because, again, this is specific. The language that's used here, the the people of God assembled, they had a solemn assembly. That's the language that's used of Israel uh, elsewhere in Scripture when they are following the Lord. It's the language that's used of Israel when they're actually following God's commands to kick the Canaanites out of the promised land. So again, as we're hearing this, and as you're an ancient Near Eastern person, you're hearing this and like, oh, maybe they're, maybe as they're seeing the depths of their own depravity, they're starting to get it. Maybe they're turning back and being like, we, we need to fix something. But again, everything about these three chapters is topsy-turvy. Everything's turned upside down. And we come to find that Instead of Israel assembling in this way to get instructions from the Lord to then continue to carry out what they were supposed to do in the first place, which is kick out these other tribes that God said didn't need to be there, we find that they've assembled basically to just come together and say, we're going to wipe Benjamin, this whole tribe, off the face of the earth. And on one hand, that appeals to, again, our sense of justice, that appeals to our sense of this is outrageous, which it should. What happened was outrageous and disgusting. But in the same way that we see this degradation of morals and even hospitality through Israel, now we get to this point where Israel assembles, they decide what they're going to do. And after they've made a decision, then scripture tells us they went up to inquire of the Lord. And when they inquired of the Lord, they didn't ask, should we even do this? They said, who goes first? One of the symptoms of a heart that's cold towards the Lord is you start to use him as an excuse and a blessing on top of whatever your decisions are. Which is what they're doing. There was no, God, what do we do next? No, God, what's your answer to this? It's, We're pretty sure we know what we need to do. And as you continue through the passage, we see all these vows that they've made. Nobody's going to go up to their beds. Nobody's going to slumber or sleep. We find out later that they said, even made additional vows. Nobody from all of Israel is going to give one of their daughters in marriage to somebody from Benjamin. They've made all these vows out of their own sense of justice and out of their own outrage. And then they're coming to God and saying, hey, we just need you to throw some blessing on this. It's good that we're sober. It's sort of a sober thing that we're talking about. It continues. I'm not going to dive too deeply into, again, the specific narrative because 
there are just, again, as a note for you guys to take with you as you read scripture, there are moments where the narrative gets really detailed and it's because there are specific details you're supposed to see. And there are other times where it'll get detailed and slow down because the author wants you to notice like, hey, we're spend some time noticing that we're talking about this. So all throughout this passage, we're seeing similar language to when Israel is going through its initial conquest. When we're talking about the book of Joshua, um, we're seeing very similar language about how they're assembling, how they're you know, coming before the Lord after a defeat and they're, you know, having these exchanges, all very similar. But again, it's not geared towards where it should have been geared towards. It's geared towards one of the tribes of Israel that God said he loved and that God promised to preserve. So we've got all this violence happening. And it takes Israel getting beaten by the men of Benjamin twice before they actually stop and ask the question, Lord, do we go up against them again or do we just stop? (laughs) And that part is funny. It's like, you think you'd get it a little bit sooner. The other gravity of the situation is we're talking tens of thousands of people had to die for them to get to that point. Tens of thousands of men who had wives, who had families, who had a future and their presumption and blindness to their own state got them to the point where those men had to pay the price for them to come to their senses, even just a little bit. So this happens, and then at this point, God responds, and he says, yes, go up. I'm going to give them into your hands today. So they go, they lay a trap, they fight, they win. And then again, we see some more of the misplaced zeal as we go down towards the end of this chapter. Starting in verse 45, then Benjamin turned and fled toward the wilderness to Rimon Rock and Israel killed 5,000 men on the highways. They overtook them at Gidom and struck 2,000 more dead. All the Benjaminites who died that day were 25,000 armed men. All were warriors. But 600 men escaped into the wilderness to Rimon Rock and stayed there four months. The men of Israel turned back against the other Benjaminites and killed them with their swords. The entire city the animals, and everything that remained. They also burned all the cities that remained. So here we start to see kind of the, again, the bloodthirstiness and the vengeance of what's going on. It's not just that these people did something wrong and they need to be punished for what they did wrong. It's we're outraged. We're going to make everybody pay. And this is the, again, why this is important moving forward through the rest of chapter 21 is this is, again, the same language that gets used in other parts of the Old Testament where God's saying you need to completely wipe some of these people out and Israel's doing it to herself. Going into chapter 21, the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah. None of us will give his daughter to a Benjaminite in marriage. So the people went to Bethel and sat before God until evening. They wept loudly and bitterly and cried out, Why, Lord God of Israel, has it occurred that one tribe is missing in Israel today? Kind of a stupid question. The next day, the people got up early, built an altar there, and offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. The Israelites asked, who of all the tribes of Israel didn't come to the Lord with the assembly? For a great oath, another one, had been taken that anyone who had not come to the Lord at Mizpah would certainly be put to death. I wanted to, again, hone in on this specific passage because... Again, there's sort of that stupid question in there. Why, Lord, is it that one of the tribes is missing from Israel today? And just to take another 10,000 foot view on this, they had the idea that Benjamin needed to get wiped out, ask God to basically say, hey, we just need you to bless this thing that we're going to do. We've got it all figured out. Don't worry about it. Just tell, it, just tell us how to, how to do it. And now that they're looking at the ramifications of what they did, they're turning back and questioning God. God, why? Like, where, I thought, where, where's Benjamin? Where's this tribe? Where's, where, where are our brothers that you were supposed to protect? And it speaks to the twistedness of their own souls where they're like, they're, they've come to this place where God needs to bless what we're doing, but then even though we're taking that action, we're blaming God for the results of it. 
it also reveals very much that they've begun to treat Yahweh the exact same way that they treat all their other gods. Let me throw you a few sacrifices, throw you a couple bones so that you're happy, so that you do what I want you to do. And then when something's not right, what's wrong with you? As the story progresses, again, none of it's good, unfortunately. They, they realize that they've made all of these rash oaths before the Lord. And on one hand, they are keeping them. It's like, hey, we're not going to give any of our daughters in marriage to Benjamin. So it's, it's more, and why that's important, it might be self-evident, but just to emphasize it, not only are all of these men from the tribe of Benjamin, not only have they been killed, but the few that remained and were unmarried, they took that extra level of wrath Israel did and said, we're not even going to give our daughters in marriage to Benjamin, basically ensuring not only are we just going to kill a lot of them, but in a few generations, they will be entirely gone. But then to go and try to get around the oaths that they made, again, it's more lying, more war, more killing. They go down to one of the towns that didn't show up at the solemn assembly. They kill all of them except for their virgin daughters so that they can have some people that they've captured as wives to give to the few remaining people from Benjamin. That wasn't enough though. So then they devise this trap where there's a celebration that's happening at Shiloh. And then they bring the survivors from the tribe of Benjamin, the few that were there. And they say, hey, we've made a vow that we can't actually like contractually give our daughters to you in marriage, but here's how we're going to get around that. You hide in the field. And then when the dancers and the, the celebrants come out of the city, you just pop out of the field and grab a wife and then head home. This is where Israel has arrived. <laughs> this is where Israel has arrived. In verse 23 of chapter 21, the Benjaminites did this and took the number of women they needed from the dancers they caught. They went back to their own inheritance, rebuilt their cities and lived in them. At that time, each of the Israelites returned from there to his own tribe and family. Each returned from there to his own inheritance. And here's that last phrase from the inclusio that I mentioned. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. I mean, there's lots of thoughts that I have about this, but if I'm going to try to, well, number one, how do you actually pull something out of this that's encouraging? Maybe not encouraging, but useful. I'll go for useful. Um, it's very easy for us in church to bemoan the state of America morally, spiritually, all of these things, but we very rarely want to take a look back to see why we got to this point. We're content to settle with the fact that it wasn't us who got us here, put it off on another generation, and then put the rebuilding of it onto the generation that's coming after us putting us in this spot where we get to pass judgment, be on our high horses, and not actually do anything. This is a generalization again, but I'm talking about an attitude of the heart that if you, again, if you look at, you don't have to look very far in terms of people within the church who are making social commentary to see the heart that I just outlined. It was somebody else who got us here and it's somebody else who's gonna get us out. But I'm just here to point out the problem. I even mentioned at the, be, at the beginning of today's time that one of the reasons the church doesn't have authority to speak to certain things is because we refused to talk about them until society filled that vacuum. Easiest one to look at, sex, sexuality, sexual identity. 
because the church has been so historically, and I will say certain branches of the church, people in, I'm, I'm going to tip over a few sacred cows here, but that's fine. People in the evangelical Protestant world really love to talk smack about Catholics. But one of the things that they have done very well, they've had a very well-defined, well-thought-out, and well-taught view of sexuality in the human body for hundreds of years that they have been teaching faithfully. That was a purely factual statement. Meanwhile, what the church tends to talk about when it comes to sexuality is before marriage, bad, after marriage, good, and we leave it at that. Do you see how that could create a vacuum? Yes. <laughs> Again, I talked about this, this book that we have as something that speaks to real issues for the real world that we live in. When it comes to these sorts of things, it's not that God is silent on the topic, it's that oftentimes we don't want to hear it. So this, today is a, a sobering kind of a message. Good. It should be. But I, what I want it to do for us more as a community is l- let it stir us to realize that our nation, our cities, our families didn't just get here overnight. At some point along the way, there were places where we got apathetic, places where we got lax, places where we decided to hand off the responsibility that was put on us. The call was given to us and we decided to hand it off to our sons and daughters. If we're going to change that, we have to come forward. We have to step up. And here's what I want to say. I am absolutely still learning how to do this. It's very, again, very easy to look at somebody who's talking on a stage and think they're lit, even even just with how this is positioned, which if I'm being perfectly honest, I also don't love, it's very easy to feel like the person up here is talking down to you because in one sense, physically, that is what's happening. (laughs) But on the other hand, it's just easy to see like you get the fruit of me studying and praying, but you don't see every single time the backlog of what's going on in my own life. I spent the last year, to give you sort of a glimpse, I've spent the last year ridding myself of an Ahab spirit. In in previous messages, we've defined a little bit of what that is, but I've spent the last year working internally on God, this level of apathy that's in my own life, this level of passivity, can't stay. Because if I'm going to shoulder what I need to shoulder in my generation, and if I'm going to shoulder what I need to shoulder for my children, I can't stay here. And in the same way, that's what Israel didn't do. Kicking these people out of the territory is really hard. I'm sure if we just camp out, our kids will take care of it. Let it not be said of us. Let it not be said of us. If you could stand, I'm going to pray for us. Come Holy Spirit. So Jesus, we just look to you. We look to you. Scripture calls you the author and the finisher of our faith. You're the one who, when we couldn't do this perfectly, you did. So Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just break every attack of shame that likes to come in on the back ends of messages like these. I break that level of shame and I speak to every heart in here and I remind every soul in here, don't look to yourself to try to fix this. Look to Jesus. 
look to the man who actually has the answer and has the capacity. So Father, we look to you right now. God, we recognize that it has fallen to us. It has fallen to us to represent you in this generation. So Father, I'm asking that you would forgive us for where we have handed this off in our own hearts to somebody else. Somebody else will take care of it, but not me. Jesus, that you would raise us up. Give us the backbones that it takes to accept the responsibility for what you've called us to. And God, I, I even speak over every heart. I speak hope over every heart in this room. God, your word said that when it was dark, you then told us to arise, shine, for your light has come. So Father, we thank you that you have an answer for what's happening in this generation. You have an answer for what's happening in this country. Thank you, Lord. Uh, as I was praying before service today, one of the things that I felt the Lord was highlighting um, just in conjunction with this was that there are some of us here who we just, if we're being honest with ourselves, there's things that we have not been obedient in that we need to repent for. So what I'm going to create space for us to do here is if that's you and there's something that you know you haven't been following the Lord in, whether it's big or whether it's small, I want you to come down and we're gonna pray. So Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would pull forward into our hearts, Lord, the things where we haven't been faithful to what you've asked us to do. Jesus, grant us the gift of repentance. Father, we look to you. God, we thank you that you have an answer for us. God, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. You are not a harsh God. So Father, we, whether we're in our chairs or whether we're up front here, God, we ask your forgiveness. Maybe it's not disobedience, but if there's anything in you that wants to respond to what the Lord's doing, maybe it was something that you started in worship, feel free to come down here too. If there's anything that the Lord's ministering to your heart about, feel free to come forward. There's zero shame and coming down here. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you. If you can all just put a hand on your heart, I'm just gonna have, you, have us repeat a prayer after me. Say, Father, we repent for where we've not been obedient. And God, we break agreement with passivity. We will not turn the responsibility of following you over to a different generation. It's our turn. Strengthen us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.